Hello and welcome to another episode on the Motherhood video series. I'm really excited that you're here again for another wonderful episode. Today I sat down with my mentor, Julia Jones from Newborn Mothers and we discussed how to build a village. We actually went a bit sidetracked and we got into the nitty gritties and what happened in different cultures and traditions and around the world. Um, and we talked a little bit about feminism as well and how um, our society's changed as well. But the thing that I really loved the most about Julia and what we discussed today was she gave us some really wonderful insights on how you can build your village, what that actually would look like, what that can actually mean for you. And we talked about some of the mindset steps that you can take in order to get you to that step to actually start village building. So as I always say, sit back, grab a cup of coffee, grab a cup of tea, pour an ice water, make sure you relax and enjoy this session. Hey, Julia, thank you so much for coming today. I'm really excited that you're here. Thanks, Ashley. It's lovely to be here. And today I'm really excited because we're going to be talking about something that's um, that I've been doing and working on as well and something that I always um, tell mothers to start doing as soon as they can. It's village building. So can you tell me why we need a village? Yeah, well, it's often something that really hits us in motherhood. I think, you know, when you're young and single and free and you can, you know, kind of just like be more spontaneous and you have more time and you have more energy, but then what happens is once we become mothers, um, we really, really notice much more the lack of, of connection and support and community that we have um, around us. And I think the thing we really don't quite understand in our culture is that our very biology, our actual bodies and brains have been designed to live in villages. We are social creatures, you know, um, and maybe not to the extent that like ants are social creatures, but definitely, um, you know, to the extent that we are designed to live together and to be together and to work together um, and and we're not supposed to do this whole motherhood thing on our own. And I know from all of the teachings that you've been teaching me basically over the traditions throughout the world and also um, how we were hundreds of years ago, it's obviously significantly changed to how our villages are now and how we're separated from our families and we've moved to different cities and we're away from everyone. So obviously village building is a lot different now in the 21st century. So how does that kind of look like for us now versus what it looked like for us a few hundred years ago? Yeah, we actually live in a very strange time. It's a, it's a really interesting time to be alive in a way because um, the way that, that we are raised in nuclear families is actually not the norm at all. There's a, there's a, a whole lot of research and they called us weird people, Western, educated, industrial, I um, can't remember what the R is for, no, democratic. Oh, rich, rich and democratic. Um, you know, and that, that, that actually the way that we live is very strange. But the problem is nearly all of our um, understanding of psychology and behavioural science is based on this weird family, you know, this weird community set up. So is, we don't really um, spend enough time thinking about things from the bigger picture. You know, how, how have humans actually been living for hundreds of thousands of years? And how do humans actually live in other parts of the world that aren't these um, weird countries, you know? And the most obvious thing you see if you do actually open your eyes and start to look around is that um, we don't live in nuclear families. That, that traditionally people lived in with their extended families and um, practice something that's called low parenting, which parenting. Uh, and that often mothers would breastfeed each other's children. Often babies will call multiple adults, auntie, uncle, grandma, grandpa, mother, father. Um, you know, and that it often, you know, in some parts of the world, children wouldn't even necessarily know who their biological mother was because it's not actually relevant, you know. There's many people who meet their needs, love them, care for them, um, you know. So I think that's really why a village is so ingrained in us. It's the way that we've been designed um, to live and that, that actually, yeah, what we're doing at the moment is totally weird. So it is kind of hard to picture how that village might actually look, you know, for us today. 
Sorry and about that. It's all right. It's so weird because um, we only know what we know now and we only know what we're raised with. And I remember like even maybe seven years ago, I used to look at different cultures and think that they were weird because they were living together or they called their mother, their auntie, their mother or their grandmother raised them and they were all living collectively. Um, in Australia, just different traditions and I thought that is so weird like why don't they want to be alone and then I had a baby and I realized that actually <laughs> they know what's going on because um, they've got so much support and help as a collective family and it's not just one person's responsibility but they all look after each other they nourish each other I mean everyone has such different traditions um, and, cult and and the cultures are so varied but um, on a surface level it's very similar but it is a true village and um, I felt as a new mother myself that I felt really isolated and lonely which is probably why a lot of mothers are feeling that isolation and loneliness and we're feeling that real call and wanting that deeper connection and support and love and nurturing um, so it completely makes sense to have that village around us. So what would it kind of look like for us now? What can we do? Obviously, we're not going to be able to magically create um, this traditional or cultural village, mm -hmm. but what can that look like for us now? Yeah, you raised some really interesting points there. I, I've had similar experiences in my own life. Partly I did actually grow up in quite a good village. We grew up in a um, small town in the city but in a street where no one had garages it's a very old um, part of Australia very narrow roads so everyone has to get on with the neighbors because you're literally living you know on top of each other you can hear each other you, you have to be respectful of you know not parking in front of each other's houses and you know that kind of thing um, you know and we did always just knock on each other's doors and play out on the street and so I was very lucky to grow up with that but definitely had a similar experience to you of taking that to the next level when I did visit India. I was about 21 or 22 at the time. I spent a year in India and I was so amazed like you that they all just piled in together and people would, will sleep anywhere in India. They literally have charpoys, which are like these day beds that they just have out the front of cafes, restaurants, houses, you know, um, in public spaces. And, and because they don't have a lot of privacy partly because it's a very populated country but also partly because they live very in a very communal way they just sleep anywhere and that's kind of surprising to me like for a western person I thought that was really weird that you would just go to sleep you know with everyone looking at you I actually experienced the same thing in Japan they sleep a lot on the trains in Japan mm -hmm. too I went there when I was 15 um on a, on a student exchange you know so I think one of the biggest things that we have to kind of let go of is this idea of privacy. Um, and obviously privacy, you know, is important to some extent and it's nice to have some privacy, but we do have to ask ourselves at what point is privacy valuable and useful and at what point is privacy actually just building walls um, around ourselves, you know. And, and when I did spend that year in India, I did learn to do things like sleep more in more communal settings. You know, I did learn that that was, um, you know, that that was just how things were done. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of you do have to sort of um, undo a little bit of your own conditioning and, and overcome of some of your own like discomfort. Another study that um, one of my friends just told me about was how a People are more likely to leave the church and leave religions when they have a lot of money. Um, and that's because you get to a certain point. Oh, my internet's unstable again, Ashley. I hope that's right. coming through okay. Again. Um, good. Um, but when people get to a certain income level, a certain level of wealth, then they buy what they need and they can afford to buy all of the services um, that they need and the goods that they need and they then don't need the community. So what happens is they leave the church, which is, you know, like the, the you know, one of the original ways that we made community. And that stands for all religions, not just, um, you know, Christianity or church-based ones. Um, I thought that was really interesting too because, again, we have to let go of some of these ideas of money, um, of independence, of privacy, like a lot of these things that we do value so highly, we have to think, you know, this is a tool and are we using this in a way that's going to be actually helping us to be happy or are we using this in a way that's, that might sound nice 
you know, and might keep us in control, but is actually not helping us to make good decisions in our, uh, in our everyday lives. So one of the interesting things that you just said is that we have to let go a little bit and, and it more so in, in regards to being independent because as a child, my dad was constantly pushing me to be confident, independent, so I could do everything myself, so I could survive in the world. And I feel like a lot of us are being pushed into, you know, being independent, getting on with life, getting a job, getting a house, living your own life. And we're being pushed that way, which I'm which I'm finding a lot. I had a conversation with a friend today and she was trying to offer a friend some support and help in postpartum and birth. And her friend was like, no, 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 I don't accept it. You know, of course she would love it. And whenever her friend does anything for her, she completely uh, adores it and loves it. But she won't accept the help. And I remember as a new mum myself that, There was a little bit of help offered to me sometimes, but I wasn't allowing myself to be vulnerable to accept the help um, because I would rather go through the hardship of doing it myself on my own than accepting the help and being seen as weak. Um, And I think that that's kind of like a teaching that maybe it's a generational thing or maybe it was just my own upbringing, but I know a lot of women will not accept help. So I'm hoping that you have some ideas and tips because I know that a lot of um, people watching this definitely would be feeling the same way. And I really want to help mothers get over this, um, you know, feeling of not accepting the help and, and be more vulnerable and ask for help and accept it. That's the first step to creating this beautiful village that we need as mothers. Yeah, it's really, it's not like a problem we can solve in an instant. And I think it probably has been more than one generation. I think it's really been a few generations. And I think really what it's about is the patriarchy. I feel like we've had for the last hundreds, however, hundreds of years, um, we've had too much masculine um, concepts kind of dominating the way that we build our communities and live our lives. And I think it really shows like... You know, you could go back hundreds of years ago, you know, to when they were burning witches, you know, in Europe and then that colonisation and those a lot of those masculine um, patriarchy kind of paradigms spread throughout the world. And I think what's happened is we have lost touch of, of the, the importance of connection and community and being together. And, and that is actually, it's not like one's better than the other, but, it, but we need balance and you can't have one without the other. So I think if you can't be feminine in motherhood and have that more give or take and and codependent relationships in a healthy way, if you can't do that in motherhood, when else in your life are you ever going to be able to embrace a more feminine way of living and how else are we ever going to change this culture for for our children, for boys and girls? Um, Because I know many men are feeling isolated and lonely um, Mm. at the moment too. Not only mothers, but I think the the stats show it's one in five or even one in four people say that they feel lonely at any given time. Mm. Um, And we know that now that loneliness is a massive health crisis. It's really becoming one of the the problems of our time and kills more people than a lot of better known health risks like smoking, obesity, um, heart disease. Loneliness contributes to um, so many, so many different um, health problems and actually kills us so it's not just a nice to have thing it's essential that i think women start stepping up and creating a different way of doing things because we're you know we've done really well in the masculine paradigm at many things but this is the gap it's the feminine stuff that's missing and you know um, I, I don't know who said it originally, but this idea that men built the world, but women now need to come in and save the world, you know. So the current world we're living in is really lacking um, in that community and, and support. So if you find it hard to ask for help for yourself, then see it as a contribution, um, you know, to, to the change that you want to see for your family in the future. So kind of like being... Wonder Woman and, uh, you know, (laughs) step by step, you know, paving the way just as I, um, you know, decide that I'm going to breastfeed in public with no, um, you know, nothing over the top of me and let my boobs out. I say in my head, even though I'm vulnerable and I'm scared that someone's going to come up and say something to me, I say in my head, I'm doing this for the next generation. I'm making this natural. I'm, you know, letting people see this. 
um, I think that's a really great way to look at it and I think it, you know, I think it also makes it feel a bit more powerful as well rather than being vulnerable and feeling like you're relying on somebody to do something. I also feel like making the first step as in, you know, when you see another mother who's pregnant or, you know, struggling that, um, you know, we offer the help as well because by doing that, people are naturally going to reciprocate um, and follow lead, you know, you know, basically live your life so that people can follow and hopefully enough people click on and we, you know, lead by example basically, isn't it? Which is a little bit hard sometimes when nobody else is doing this, the thing that you want them to do. But I guess looking back at the last couple of years, I've created a wonderful community of loving and supportive women um, and I had friends saying to me, that'll never happen. You'll never have wonderful, supportive women around you. Um, and look what I've created. I've created a wonderful circle of um, support of women. So I think that's a great um, first couple of steps. So if we put ourselves out there and start asking for help or accepting help, can you explain a little bit about what the village actually looks like today and, um, you know, how that would kind of work? and what sort of ways we can, you know, look at starting to build that. Yeah, so as we mentioned, I think the first step is always really the mindset stuff because we, you know, we are magnetic and we'll attract what we expect. So like your friends who are saying, oh, that doesn't exist, that's there's not out there, it's not possible. Well, they're never going to find those people if that's the way that they're looking at the world. Whereas if you... Um, decide that you're going to, um, one of my favourite actual very small and easy techniques is to smile at strangers, mm. um, you know, because it just shows the universe that you're open to this. And it was actually Phoebe, one of our collective students, who um, I've talked about this on my podcast with as well. Mm. But there's um, there was a great research done in Boston that, that they um, got people to talk to people on trains and buses. So during their commute, to work this guy who studies lonely so I can't remember his name now but it's a Boston study you'll be able to find it if you want to google it mm -hmm. um, but he he realized that we are sitting on the train or the bus for 45 minutes perhaps every single day maybe even longer and he said we're treating the other people like they're he in his words lampshades <laughs> it's like they're no more than like the decor of the train it's and you're like trying you to hide from them this. you're like trying yeah. to hide from them looking in your phone like i don't want to be seen i don't want to talk to you i don't want to be acknowledged exactly and and what is it you know what is it that drives this behavior it's such a crazy thing to do, to, to dehumanise other people so frequently, you know, every day in our lives. And no wonder, you know, if we're closing ourselves down in that very small daily way, no wonder we're also closing ourselves down in a much, much bigger social, you know, community, global kind of level. Um, so his research showed that when um, they split the group up, the groups up and they got some people to initiate conversations and some people not to, to keep, you know, in their bubble, um, and almost without fail, they even did research on personality types, almost without fail, everyone who spoke to someone on their commute was happier. Um, whether they're introverted or extroverted or, you know, whether they like meeting people or don't like meeting people or they're shy or they're confident, it really didn't matter. Everyone had a better time and was happier after striking up a conversation with a stranger on the train. You know, so these are the kinds of just totally simple things things that that we can do that um really open up our minds to the possibility that we're not the only one who feels lonely um, mm. and that we're not the only one who feels unsupported um you know but i think it's that fear that probably stops us from reaching out we think oh they're just going to think that i'm a loser you know mm. but actually they're probably really happy to have some human contact too because we are all social creatures I find that, um, you know, even without that study, I 100% know that whenever I talk to a stranger or have a conversation with somebody, I feel so much happier because uh, I, don't, it, I always do. It doesn't matter if, because no one talks to you when you go to the shops or go out, but old people always stop for a chat and they would talk about anything. And then afterwards, I have a bit of a spring in my step and, you know, everything feels good and the world's not doom and gloom anymore. But um, as a natural rule, I wouldn't 
go and talk to people. But um, I think I'm going to start doing that. I was having this conversation the other day. So I think that's a really good step. Um, and the, and you talk and then you realise you're not alone and you realise that your feelings, you're not alone and it just spirals, doesn't it? Yeah, and it didn't matter what the conversation was about. That was the other great thing about the study. It didn't matter whether you talk about the weather or you have a big D&M or you have a debate about politics. It actually didn't matter. As long as the person you talked to wasn't, you know, actually a, a, a safety threat, you know, I think there were occasions when the person they talked to wasn't a safe person to talk to. But other than that, they always made you happier. And it just goes to show that the decisions we make in our daily lives and what we think will make us happy, it's not always right. We don't always make the right choices. And, you know, here's an example from my personal life. When I had my first baby, I actually didn't have my driver's license. Um, and so I would catch the train and the bus everywhere. And it was really great because, you know, if anyone's ever been on a bus or a train with a baby, like you said, especially elderly people, but everyone is just, will smile at you. They will look at your baby. They'll offer to help. They just, you know, people love seeing toddlers and babies out and about. So that was really wonderful. Then I, then I did end up getting a car and my license and started driving more and more because, you know, the more kids you have, the harder it is to get on public transport. Um, and now, you know, when I go to the shops and back or when I go to mum's group and back, I, I don't interact with as many people. So a lot of the things that, you know, we think will make us happy, you know, they don't, they don't, we just have to use them discerningly. We can't just like say that more money is better, more cars are better, you know, more freedom is better, more control, more privacy. All of these things can be used in ways that are going to make us happy and build our villages and connect us or... Um, or not they can be used in the opposite ways as well good point I think I think definitely mindsets probably like from my experience in my life I think that's and 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 with everything mindset for everything but definitely village building I think that's a huge one I think if we can start to think about that more and actually start implementing that, I think that'll open the doors a little bit to have those conversations what are some other ways so if we decide that, yeah, okay, we want to use our mindset, we're going to put ourselves out there, what are some other ways that we can, you know, start to grow our village or, you know, sort of get that support and help in our village? And do we need to get lots of people or do we just need to have one or two people? Or how does that even look like? What does it look like? Well, I think really the more the merrier as long as they're the right kind of people. I know that there are certain people who sometimes I reach out to and sometimes the way that they respond shows that they still feel really guilty about accepting help or they feel really awkward that I've helped them or I don't know, you just kind of get that feeling like, oh, yeah, she's not going to be in the village, you know. <laughs> Um, but as long as they're the right kinds of people, people who are also open to this, um, then the sky's the limit. I mean, your village can be family, friends, neighbours, online, you know, by phone, by email, by letter. It, your village can include people who are like the guy who makes your coffee or, you know, the anyone, like really anyone can be part of your village. And I think it's important to know that your village is really a multifaceted thing because a lot of people say, oh, but I don't have a village. And what they usually mean is they're newly arrived to an area and they don't have their old family and friends there. But, you know, you can go and knock on a neighbor's door and, and take a cake over. You can join a crocheting class. Um, you know, there are so many different things you can do. So I think once you've kind of got your mindset on board, once you've started opening yourself to by to like talking to strangers on the bus and that sort of thing then the next step might actually be putting yourself out there in a way that you might be rejected because that is ultimately very scary so you know it might be that you ask someone for something and they might say no or that you offer something and they might say no um or that you join a group and it turns out you don't like any of them or that they aren't very nice to you. Um, so that kind of gets a little bit scarier and a bit harder, but if you can kind of build up to that slowly, I think, um, and, and remember that not everyone is going to be open to this and that's not about you, that's about them, um, then I, I think you can have great success um, in village building just by continuing to, to take those small steps. 
I think that's true. I think uh, we need to get that resilience as well. And it's kind of a bit hard sometimes when we've got all those hormones flushing through our body and we're feeling vulnerable and we have expectations as well of um, of what sort of support that we're after as well. So I think um, keeping it simple and just starting off small and um, realising that we're in a vulnerable state as well. Um, and it's not the end of the world if someone does um you know reject you or however you feel it's going to be I know um, often times in my life if I didn't feel comfortable in a mother's group or something like that I would just kind of come home and then I wouldn't try it for a very long time um, because I was scared off for a very long time so I think realizing that it's not the end of the world and that there's thousands and hundreds of different groups out there and it just may take a little time to find your group um, and the right people for you and that's okay and there's nothing wrong with you as a person it's just finding the right thing for you at the right time that makes you happy brings you peace and joy and that sort of thing and it's a lifelong journey right it's something that we have to continue to build on basically for the rest of our lives um, but I really love the idea of having a neighbor and I was I was thinking the other day I'm gonna start I read an article on the internet it was in regards to village building or something it was why you should go next door and ask for a cup of sugar or something like that and I was like I would love to like go next door and ask for a cup of sugar if I run out of something at home I would love to dip next door and say hey have you got this and I'll borrow that and then I'll borrow you know I think that that's really awesome so I think that I'm gonna start um, initiating that in my life as well and I think yes um, you know I think we can all just take a little step and you know start building a village yeah exactly you know and that's such a simple thing to do is to go and borrow a cup of sugar <laughs> one of my dear friends who is also part of my village is uh, always talks about how one of the most important things is to have actually a reason to get together because if you just, you know, you've all got those friends who are like, we're long overdue to catch up for coffee and you just never get around to it. Months and months go past. But if you have a reason like you're going to get sugar from a neighbor, then that, that puts it to the top of your list so that you actually do it. Um, and I've seen the same strategy used, you know, in very deliberate community development settings as well. I know that there's a, um, a community farm, a social farm in a suburb near me, and they have chickens. And one of the great things about chickens is they need feeding every day and they need someone to come and get the eggs every day. And so that means that there's constantly this people coming in and out for a reason. They have to go to get the eggs, even if they're kind of like, oh, I'm tired today, I can't be bothered, I'm busy. They're like, well, I have to get the eggs, so I've got to go. But then that means they are also going to bump into the other farmers and friends and, and neighbours and communities, you know, on the way. So as much as you can, build those things together so that your social life and your chores aren't separate siloed things, but that all becomes part of your mm. everyday life. Well, this is really exciting and I am so thankful that you've come on to talk to us about village building. You were talking about an awesome download freebie before. Um, could you tell us about that? Yes. So I've created a free guide because this is such a hot topic. I actually studied community development way back at university so many years ago. So it's something I've always been really passionate about. Um, and, and in my more recent work with motherhood, I'm just hearing it more and more people are saying, you know, sometimes they're actually lonely, uh, but also sometimes they just need the practical support. They're like, I just want to not have to cook dinner every night or I want to have friends I can ask, um, you know, to have my kids for a little bit while I do whatever I need to do. Um, you know, so there's really emotional and practical benefits to having a village and I think we're all feeling it at the moment. I would be surprised if there's, you know, many people in Australia right now who, who aren't feeling like they've lost something there um you know so I talk to we end up having this conversation I wish I had it just yesterday I had the conversation if only I had a friend that could look after my kids for a couple of hours you know it, it's the repeat conversation that I seem to keep hearing and it must be like you said biological it's in us it's something that we desire we just don't know how to go about it so I think some of these tips are going to be really helpful for mothers to start be able to create their village um, and remember that Wonder Woman song and <laughs> sing that when they're doing it and putting themselves out there. <laughs> You're going to have to sing the song now, Ashley. <laughs> I know. Well, it was supposed to be Beyonce, I Run the World, 
it's I run the world, who runs the world, girls? But I sing, I'm Wonder Woman, yeah, I'm Wonder Woman, yeah. And I didn't know that that was actually the lyrics until recently. <laughs> oh, I love it. But, but here's the thing, like we really need to redefine Wonder Woman, don't we? Because Wonder Woman isn't someone who does it on her own. Like right. Wonder Woman in the movie, she has her mother and her, all of the women the around her, all of, mm. yeah, the aunts. It's not actually her yeah. mother, is it? I think I'm remembering that It wrong. was her mother and her aunt, but they were all like a sisterhood of women that were surrounding yeah. after each other. Um, yeah. 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 And, so and that's how women... She's got Superman, yeah. and Batman, everyone. So she's connected. Exactly. You know, so. Yeah, we need to <laughs> stick a few more chicks into that tribe too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because this is our strength as women, you know. Our strength as women is being together and, and harnessing the power yeah. of when everyone's together. So, yeah, I just keep seeing it more and more. So I decided I finally got to do it. It's been on my list for years and years mm -hmm. to write this um, free guide, which is 10 ways to build your 21st century um, village. So it does include a couple of the things we've talked about today and a whole lot more, mm. but it's an ebook that people can download if they're feeling like they've got this, this in their life, this lot, this lack, you know, there's something missing. Um, then I think they will really, uh, love that guide as a starting point. Well, I downloaded it myself and had a sneaky peek and I was just on my phone. I was like, this is amazing. And I was only on the first page and I was like, yep, I'm going to remember that one. And, oh, yes, I did that one. And so I highly recommend it for anyone who's, you know, wanting to build that village. Um, it's a really great resource there. So thank you so much, Julie, for coming on today. It's been awesome to have you on. My pleasure, Ashley. It's one of my favourite topics to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Bye. watching this episode make sure you subscribe to this youtube channel our mailing list and follow us in our social channels so you never miss an episode all our details are listed in the description box in youtube i look forward to bringing you another great episode next week welcome to our circle of support mama with the motherhood circle see you next week with love ashley <laughs>